And I'm Dr. Craig Fasulo. I'm with Collaborative Natural Health. Uh, we have offices in Manchester, West Hartford, Glastonbury, Stonington, and a few other places that will be listed later. Most of you are probably familiar with us, but if you're not, then glad to have you. And we're going to be talking about uh, a functional and naturopathic approach to heart disease. So it's February and it's heart month. So I think the last time I did this was last year. And my big addition to this slide presentation last year was this lovely Bob Ross representation. I'm sure everyone's old enough to know about Bob Ross. Uh, he made us smile and now his hair is shaped like a heart and he makes me smile even more. So uh, as the time of year, we talk about people's hearts. Uh, we love each other and, and all that. So let's dive in. So we're just gonna do a little basics first. We're gonna talk about the basics of what heart disease is. Uh, essentially, there's two different components when we think about heart disease. We think about the heart itself, the pump and the valves and the aspects of the electrical components of the heart. And then we talk, we talk about the vasculature, right? The blood vessels. <clears throat> so you see this list of things here, coronary artery disease, uh, top of the list, essentially, and this is a lot of what I work with with people, the, the blood vessels throughout your body are important, but especially are important are the ones that feed back into your heart. You can see in that image, there are uh, big red and blue valves coming out of the top of the heart. That red one is blood coming out of the heart. That's the aorta. Uh, and the blue one is bl blood going back into the heart, the vena cava, uh, big vein and big artery on either side. Once the blood comes out of your heart, it goes to two different places. First, you see some vessels running up towards the neck area. Um, that's a lot of blood getting to your brain. That's really important. We need brains. Blood to brains. And then, uh, then we see some red and blue on the heart itself. So those are the blood vessels that feed the heart. That's the other super important place. So coronary artery disease is uh, an issue with the blood vessels that feed the heart. And that's important. We'll talk more about that later. Running through this list, we've got hardening of the arteries. We've got narrowing of the arteries. We've got blood pressure issues, arrhythmias, which is an irregularity of the beat. Hyperlipidemia, we'll talk about more. That's the whole cholesterol thing, which feeds into a bunch of other stuff. Uh, congestive heart failure, where uh, quite, quite so, there's failure of the, of the musculature and the, the valvular components of the heart. Heart attacks, and when it just stops, I and mean, that's a problem when it just stops, and, and strokes as well. So, you know, what I like to tell people when I'm talking about all this heart stuff is your heart works really, really well until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it's a really big deal. Heart attacks and strokes are the two ways that it stops working pretty quick um, in different ways. And, and those are things we want to avoid. And all this preventative stuff that we talk about is so that, you know, maybe not next year or the year after, but 10 and 20 years from now, we're lowering our risk of these things. By the numbers, heart disease is still the leading cause of death in America. Um, we, I think, sort of know that, but I get a little complacent. Um, cancer takes up a lot of our uh, sort of disease, concern, fear, and for good reason, it seems to come out of nowhere sometimes, and there's different times, and we, know how to, we don't know how to um, find it all the time. But cardiovascular disease claims a lot more lives than cancer does, and so we need to take this seriously. And there's all these, you know, big, scary statistics. Someone has a heart attack every 34 seconds in the United States. Um, every day someone dies from something heart related. Heart disease costs us a lot, a lot, a lot of money. That's important too. Uh, and I think one thing to note, and this has become more uh, shared in the literature, and I think that's important and, and publicly as well, that, um, that Heart disease is not just a male-centric issue, right? Um, women die of heart disease too. In fact, far more women die from heart disease than from breast cancer. And this little bit at the bottom, 50% of men, 64% of women who die suddenly of coronary artery type events had no previous symptoms. 
So we want to figure this stuff out before that happens. And that's what I like to do with people. I included this slide last year. And at this point, um, we know a lot more about this, uh, that when people have had COVID, they are at increased risk for all sorts of inflammatory cardiovascular diseases. Um, we're saying right now that's at least a year out, but we don't know because this is all pretty new. And it's important to note that uh, these things are happening even in people who didn't have really severe hospitalized COVID infections. So this is very much still coming down the pike. We're still trying to figure out how these things are related and what it means in the long term. Um, but it just, what it means in the short term is that more people are having more cardiac related issues and more people are nervous about the possibility of having or having had a coronary or cartery, um, excuse me, cardiovascular issue uh, following a COVID illness. So the ability to dive into more of these specifics as far as um, evaluation and numbers and referrals is even more important now. The risk factors for heart disease are the things you expect them to be as we get older. Uh, certainly our risk for everything goes up, including heart disease. Uh, having higher blood pressure, if there's more pressure in the system, any system, think of plumbing, uh, it, the risk of something happening at a weak point is going to be increased. So there's a relationship there. Uh, certainly high cholesterol is a risk factor. Uh, I think there's more nuanced detail to that than just on the face of it. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Diabetes is a risk factor. Uh, more sugar in the system, in the body, increases inflammation. Inflammation is a driver for heart disease. Smoking causes inflammation. Inflammation is a driver for heart disease. Being overweight is inflammatory. Inflammation is a driver for heart disease, right? So there's a theme here. Sedentary lifestyle, lack of good nutrition, inflammatory markers or inflammatory um, components, again, increasing risk of heart disease. All those, most of those are controllable, maybe not getting older. Uh, family history, not so much, but you know, we, can, we can do a lot to, to modify our risk based on our family history. And this is the last one we added, you know, more recently having, uh, having COVID previously, which, you know, at this point is becoming most people. So, you know, we're just, our population is changing. We're trying to determine what that means for purposes of public health. And we're, we're in the middle of it. More depressing numbers. Uh, people are getting bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I mean, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty notable. It doesn't we just look around and we see, but the sad reality is that more than nearly half of American adults are obese at this point. Uh, the rates of young people becoming overweight to obese is frightening because I don't know where that goes in the future. And, uh, and why? Well, the reason is that it's just gotten all really easy to not do a lot. Right, so sedentary behavior, now everyone works for home and all that comes with that. So it's just becoming easy and easier to do less. And then of course, there's the food piece, which I may or may not have a slide for. Um, Non-fat craze, generation ago, fat came out of everything, got replaced with more sugar and starch and refined carbohydrates and people are getting bigger. So that's a problem too. Um, people still smoke. Um, doesn't help. Important to note that there's a difference in what happens to men and women. Again, this is becoming more publicly discussed and I think that's really good, really important. The easy way to remember it is that in terms of cardiovascular events, men explode, women erode. So that Hollywood style heart attack, grab your chest, stagger around a little bit, fall hard. That's, you know, you're, not that that happens all that often, but it does sometimes. Uh, but that's more of a, a male presentation versus a, a women's presentation that can be more subtle. You know, can look, feel like indigestion, uh, GI issues, that can be vomiting, 
You can still get that pain down your arm, but maybe not. And the reason is that with men, larger vessels that affect the heart are more affected. So it's a more dramatic response versus the smaller vessels in women. There's more calcified plaque in, and men tend to build more calcified plaque. And we'll talk about that more because we're gonna talk about calcium scores in a little bit. So we're gonna dive into cholesterol and this is you know, contextually or clinically, this is where I usually meet people because I'm seeing folks in the office who either have high cholesterol and have told they should take a medication and are a bit resistant or have tried a medication and doesn't feel very good, or perhaps just know that they're, they've been told their cholesterol is too high, right? We've, we've created this very strong association between what's your cholesterol and what's your risk of heart disease? Like it's the same thing. So it's a factor, but it's not the same thing. There's more to it than that. So I think of all the numbers in medicine, the numbers are associated with your health, more than any other number, people have this like strong link or knowledge of their total cholesterol number. What's your cholesterol? What's your cholesterol? Is it above 200? Is it below 200? If it's below 200, it's probably good. If it's above 200, it's probably bad. You probably need a medication, All right? So that, that's become like this over super simplified heart issue. That's the beginning and the end of the conversation. So we go, we go far beyond that. Essentially, the total cholesterol number to me is the least important of all the numbers, but it's the one we've been stuck on. So we're gonna go beyond that. If we get beyond that, the first step is we look at HDL versus LDL. We call LDL bad cholesterol, we call HDL good cholesterol. And it's not just about those either. And this very important statistic is that 50% of people with heart attacks have normal LDL levels because um, it's not just about that. Because we have to look at the particles. So that's what we do, we look at the particles. The take home here is that that basic lipid panel that we do all the time that everyone gets done once a year at your annual, where it's got total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglyceride, and maybe a ratio between some of those things. That's what we usually get. Um, it's some of the information, but it's not, all of it. Uh, there's a lot more to it. So we have at our disposal now these more advanced lipid panels, and we'll dive more into that, but they're looking at particle sizes and particle numbers of LDL and HDL. And perhaps as important, if not more important, we're looking at markers of inflammation because inflammation is the driver of the wrong kind of cholesterol going to the wrong place and doing damage. We'll talk a little more about that. Then there are these things called calcium scores that we'll dive into, looking at um, calcified plaque in the coronary arteries. We'll get into that a little further. Um, so all those things are what I do in the office. And then when there's a concern, that's when we send people up out to cardiologists. And I, I refer to cardiologists all the time. Um, I have some really great relationships with cardiologists in the area that appreciate what we do and um, the thoroughness in which we do it and um, they send us patients that want to dive a little deeper. We send them people that we're concerned about. It all works out real good. Essentially, by the time something shows up on a stress test, you know, people talk about 90% blockage, 95% blockage. Uh, you know, you think of a pipe in your house coming out of your sink that's 95% blocked with whatever nasty stuff gets down there. Um, not a lot of water is getting through, right? That's pretty blocked up. Your sink is, is full of some liquid at that point. And it's, it's remarkable that the body can still maintain at that level, right? Because uh, there are other ways for the blood to go and we, we, we get through. Uh, but what we're trying to do is catch things well, well before that point. And using all these markers, we can see the writing of the wall before that happens so that we can make better decisions sooner and not wait until the wheels are falling off. Another important thing to note here is that indeed your body needs cholesterol. So cholesterol has been this thing that's been uh, kind of demonized, right? But high cholesterol, heart disease, bad stuff. You know, if we take a step back from that and think about it for a second, well, 
mostly our body makes cholesterol. So why would our body make something that is solely there to destroy us? That just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And it turns out that's because it's, it's not the case. The body is wiser than that. So if you look at this chart here, you look on the top left and there's cholesterol. And you look at all these other things listed here and some of them you might be familiar with. You might see testosterone, which you know we wanna get high in men, right? To be healthy. You might see estrogen and you might see progesterone. You don't see estrogen, you see estrone, estradiol. Those are different forms of estrogen. Um, progesterone, so those are their, like, their classic female horm hormones. Cortisol, which is our energy throughout the day. It's a stress hormone. So turns out that cholesterol turns into all these hormones. It all starts as cholesterol. So we need that. In fact, our brains are, are made partially of cholesterol. And um, it's, it's a vital, important part of what makes up our body. Now, again, it's not about total cholesterol. It's about what's in there, the kind of cholesterol. And that's what we need to find out. So here's this whole particle number thing again. My, the way I explain it in the office for people is uh, you, know, you have either a carpet, some rug, and you put some tennis balls down on the carpet. It's very easy to then pick those tennis balls up and out the door you go. If you throw some sand down on the carpet, it's gonna be a lot harder to get that sand out. So small particles, small LDL particles are like sand. They get stuck in the carpet. Take a step back. Why do we call LDL bad cholesterol? Why do we call HDL good cholesterol? It turns out that LDL and HDL are not actually cholesterol. What they are are cholesterol carrying proteins. So cholesterol is this fatty thing and your blood is a watery thing. And we all know that oil and water, fat and water don't mix very well, right? So the cholesterol needs a way to get around in the blood. And that's what LDL and HDL are. We call LDL bad cholesterol because it carries the cholesterol particles from your liver, where you mostly make cholesterol, out to your blood vessels. You can see those little circles, plaque formation, right? So it doesn't do that. It doesn't carry it out there because it's trying to clog you up. It does that to repair damage. And that's the in inflammation piece. Inflammation creates damage in the vessel wall. LDL gets laid down essentially as a Band-Aid more band-aids, more plaque, eventually trouble. So going back to particles, the bigger HD, the bigger LDL particles tend to get stuck in the vessel wall less. Smaller LDL particles get stuck in the vessel wall, wall more. So we can have a moderate LDL total number like you see in a basic lipid panel. If you have a higher small LDL particle size number, um, that's gonna be more risky than a lower one. There are these things called lipoproteins. So that's what LDL and HDL are, they're lipoproteins and they carry things around. And that's more important to look at than just what the cholesterol is. If we think of the, the traffic metaphor, right? The cars are the particles. It doesn't matter how many people are in the cars and it matters how many cars there are. If there's too many cars, things get clogged up, right? Traffic jam, can't go anywhere. That's the particles. What we wanna do is we wanna have a lot more people in each car, bigger molecule, that makes for less traffic, less traffic jams. Same thing. It's not the total amount of cholesterol that causes heart disease, it's the number of LDL particles. Different ways of saying the same thing. You have these slides, so you can look back at this stuff. Here we are again, similar sort of thing. Uh, looking at different parameters. Uh, this book, for people that are interested in this, want to take a little deeper dive. Uh, it's called The Great Cholesterol Myth, which is a little bit of a, you know, Look, look, I'm, you know, I'm buying my book. <laughs> um, but the information is really good. Stephen Sinatra uh, is still, but now is retired, is a cardiologist who actually practiced right down the block from our office in Manchester, has since retired, but um, still does really good work. 
And so this is a, this is a deeper explanation to into inflammation and particle size and all those things. So when people want to look more, this is you know before I used to recommend books before the internet just had all the information all the time. But if you want like a good source, good source. So here we go. So uh, when I run blood work for people, it looks something like this. Now this is all run through Quest, which is, um, you know, a nationally available lab. I am not employed by Quest. I don't, uh, they don't give me any money. They should for all the labs I do for them, but they don't. Um, but years ago, Quest bought out Cleveland Heart Lab, which is associated with Cleveland Clinic, um, but essentially a, a permanent, cardiovascular lab in the country and took on all these really great advanced cardiovascular tests. And they're available through Quest now, which is great because Quest is easy to come by. So if you look at this and if you can read this, I don't know, but let's see. So there's this top panel right here, this top little box, top left, and it says lipid panel. So that's what you usually get when you get your cholesterol checked. And then the rest of this page and the other page are all these other tests that we can run that gives us more information about what your cardiovascular risk is. I don't run all these on every person, depends on the person, but if there's concern about all these things, we can know the numbers. And if we know the numbers, we can make far more educated decisions about our health. It just makes sense. I sort of think of this as one big iceberg and there's this water line, right? Right here, right, right, right below that lipid panel. And we're always looking above the surface. And as we all know, sometimes most of the iceberg is under the water. So at this point, I don't think of a good reason to not know this stuff. Um, there, they, if you see the top there, it says Cardio IQ. So Quest has this program that um, essentially allows you to, to run a bunch of labs and some of it your, your insurance will deny. And then how did they eat the rest? But um, you don't, you're not responsible for the balance. So we can get these run 99% of the time with people who have insurance and it costs pretty minimal compared to you know, what you're getting. All right, so let's go away. What about triglycerides? So, you know, going back to sort of the basics because I, I put a lot of uh, attention into the triglyceride number. Of all the cholesterol numbers, triglycerides are the ones that are most directly correlated with those sugars and starches and carbohydrates that we all eat too much of. There is a relationship between elevated triglycerides and higher LDL particles or more small LDL particles. And then the other way there's a relationship with triglycerides and increasing blood sugar and insulin resistance, which leads to things like diabetes. So you can see, you know, all the, all the food choices there, you know, all of which are probably delicious. And I am, for the record, I am not a, uh, you know, only eat kale and salmon every day forever, right? It's all about balance. So none of these things that you see are terrible. Some are better than others, maybe looking at the picture. Um, some are maybe a little terrible, but everything in moderation and moderation sometimes is a small amount, but it's, it's living. So I, I try to find uh, a way to eat healthy, be healthy, and also live happy. Look for that balance. So uh, one important thing from this slide, uh, I look at a relationship between triglycerides and HDL. I think that's an important uh, little piece of information we can derive from a, from a, from a, just from a basic lipid panel. The goal is two to one, two triglycerides to one HDL. So for example, like triglycerides 100, HDL 50, great. Unfortunately, what I see a lot of is triglycerides 250, HDL 20, 30. In fact, that's not as good. Oh, 
Other important cardiovascular markers. So all these are potentially um, testable in the blood work that we do. I think we have another slide on lipoprotein A, so I'll come back to that, but essentially it's a, it's a hereditary marker um, that is worth knowing if you have a family history of heart disease. CRP, HSCRP is a vascular infl inflammatory marker. It's general, and if, and if you twist your ankle, your CRP is gonna go up, but then it's gonna come back down and that's okay. But when we see moderate elevations over a long time, that means there's more inflammation in the body and that inflammation is in the blood vessels and those blood vessels are getting damaged and we know what happens after that. LPPLA2, is an enzyme that, respond, that responds to unstable plaques, but essentially a marker of plaque formation, of soft plaque formation. MPO is myeloperoxidase, that's to do with white blood cells, oxidative stress. It's more unstable plaques, more damage, more risk. Homocysteine is a metabolic marker having to do with methylation of B12 and folate, and increased homocysteine has to do with stiffening of the arteries and more inflammation. There's ApoB, which is a carrier of LDL. Uh, the ApoE4 is a gene that um, if, you, if you have that, you have an increased risk of heart disease. And also it's very closely linked to early onset Alzheimer's. Um, and people are doing more genetic testing to determine these things. You know, that's genetic testing is a whole nother bag. Some things we want to know, maybe some things we don't want to know. It's hard to say, it's complicated, so we don't do those willy-nilly, but it's available. The point is not to memorize a list of things you never heard of. It's more to say, look at all this stuff that's really important and you should know about it because then you can, then you can know about it. And you can decide to do things the way you want to do them based on all the information. So this is important. Um, this is what I'm talking about. When we're talking about heart disease and we're talking about cholesterol, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about blood vessels going from how they look on the left side, nice and clear, to the building up of a little plaque at the bottom there as it builds and it builds and it builds. And then on that last slide, we see a rupture on top. That's bad because then stuff gets flowing downstream, gets stuck somewhere else, and you know, that's bad news, right? So all that yellow stuff we see is, is soft plaque. And the only way to fully evaluate a soft plaque is um, by doing what's called an angiogram. So that's what the cardiologist does. They thread a catheter, a stick it in your leg or in your arm and thread it to your heart and take a little camera and look. So, you know, we try not to do that. It's kind of invasive and unpleasant. Some of those risk markers or some of those blood markers, the LPPLA2, the MPO, they help us, they're indicators of some of this plaque formation. But when we're talking about cholesterol, this is actually what we're talking about, this happening in the blood vessels. I said I was gonna talk about lipoprotein A again, and here we are. That guy on the right is Bob Harper. He, you may know him or recall, he was the personal trainer, a super energetic personal trainer he, um, for The Biggest Loser, that TV show a couple of years ago, a bunch of years ago now. Um, you know, rip roaring, energetic, getting people into shape and the show got over and then he had this massive heart attack and everyone was like, whoa. That's not supposed to happen. He's healthy. Turns out that Bob Harper had very high levels of lipoprotein A, which I don't think he knew about at the time because it wasn't tested. Um, and here are, the, here are the stats, right? So it's not rare, one in five people. It's common. It's the strongest single inherited risk factor for early coronary artery disease, narrowing of the artery aortic stenosis. So this is, this is serious stuff. Cardiologists are checking for this now. People are looking at this now. It's in the news. People you know are getting this done because it's really good information. When you have high lipoprotein A, you have between a two and four times higher risk of some cardiovascular issue compared to people otherwise. 
it's very common when there's a strong family history of, of uh, cardiovascular disease that this is present. To, um, to today, there is not a direct treatment for lipoprotein A. There's some drug that's still in the works. They'll probably come out with it at some point. We'll see. Um, but for now, what it means is, for my patients, uh, when it's high, that it's just extra important to do all the other stuff. Now, one could argue, well, Bob Harper did all the other stuff and he had a heart attack. Um, my theory that I have not explored at all is that, yes, he, he ate well, probably still does. Um, obviously very physically fit and active, but imagine the stress of being the personal trainer for this American show. I mean, like, stress, 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 which we've seen, I've seen throughout COVID uh, be a major, major factor in all these cardiovascular markers. So, you know, healthy, healthy on the face of it, but there's always more under the surface. This is uh, more information about lipoprotein A. This is the handout I give people. You can read it later, I'm not gonna read through it. Uh, and then we get to calcium scoring. So I'm gonna run back over here. So again, clear blood vessel, soft plaque buildup. If we extended this out further to the left, assuming this didn't rupture and a bad thing didn't happen, if you're building soft plaque for long enough, eventually it starts to harden and calcify. So you think about um, sand built up over you know, generations, millennia, whatever, into, into rock, sedimentary rock. So essentially it's that process happening. Now, if we're talking about the blood vessels around your heart, we can do something called a calcium score, which is in fact a simple, affordable, non-invasive way to assess progressive cardiovascular disease. So what we're looking at is calcified plaque buildup in the blood vessels that feed the heart specifically. You can see all these studies run through here, essentially saying in different ways that when the uh, calcium scores are a really powerful way to predict cardiovascular event risk over time. And it really it works out really well. Now, if you remember from one of those earlier slides from the beginning, men tend to build more calcified plaque, women tend to retain more soft plaque. So a calcium score is important across the board, but it's especially important for men, or I think maybe it like has a little more weight with men because they tend to build more plaque. Now that means that when a woman has a high calcium score, I take that extra seriously because it's all the more uh, relatively uncommon or less common, we'll say. So what this is, is a little mini CT, like a CT scan, just around your heart. Uh, there's no dyes, there's no injections. It's super quick and easy. Um, there are imaging facilities in our area that do them for 99 bucks, um, cash, some insurance is picking them up sometimes. Sometimes we try to go through insurance and it costs you more because medical system, there we go. Um, so usually I just have people do that, the 99 bucks and done thing, um, but it's a great piece of information. So essentially what it does is it risk stratifies the people that I see, because I see a lot of people with, you know, I run all those tests, those cardiovascular tests. And there are some people that look just great. All green, you saw the color, yellow, green, or green, yellow, red, all green, good news. A lot of people that are like all red, like, okay, we got to do all the things. And then most people are right in the middle. So middle of the road numbers, very low calcium score. That's one group of people. Same numbers, high calcium score a little more attention, maybe a cardio referral. But again, it gives us information and we're doing this well before there is some event or stress test modification or angina and like ischemic sort of change. Uh, and that way we're trying to predict and lower risk, you know, decades away instead of waiting. We're gonna run through some basic treatment stuff. I'd say this is the least important part of this whole presentation um, because it's not about the treatment. And I think it's important to, to say that because, but it is about the treatment, but at the beginning, it's not 
people come in because they don't want to take a stat and, and they want like the natural alternative, but they come in with their lipid panel. And the first thing is never here, try this instead. It's let's get all the information so we can make a better decision. And then let's talk about those decisions after the fact. Uh, I always start with the basics. There's nothing as important as the fundamental basics of lifestyle. Uh, I think of them as four legs of a chair. And if you're missing a leg, then the chair is not going to stand up or you're going to fall down every time. And, you know, all the, all the medications and the supplements and all the things, they just, they, if, if you don't have a good foundation, then it's just scaffolding that's temporarily holding up something that's going to fall down anyway. So we got to eat well, we got to stay moving, we got to manage our stress and we got to sleep well. That's it. Those things, I mean, that's, and that's not just heart disease, that's every chronic condition, right? All things that happen to us in a bad way over time are affected by how we eat, how we move, how we sleep, how we deal with our stress. This is, I'm like a broken record with my patients every day, every day. Back to that, back to that. Well, how about this, uh, you know, this weird little, this other uh, test or this like supplement thing that's supposed to like, you know, fix all my problems. Oh, but you, but you, are not sleeping or like this thing is happening in your life. So back to the basics. I'm gonna go a little fast ish because it's like, I should, maybe I shouldn't, right? So that's the thing when it's so basic, it's like, you know it, but it turns out that knowing it isn't enough. You actually have to do it. <laughs> but if you see me in the office, then I'll harp on this all day long. But for now, it is important to know that it turns out that if the blood goes through our blood vessels a little more vigorously, that's good for them. You know, well, that makes sense. Surprise, surprise, right? The American Heart Association uh, recommends at least 30 minutes, at least five days a week. I mean, it's so little time and most people aren't there or even close because again, we live in a world where you just don't have to do anything and we're all doing too much anyway. So finding more time to move your body uh, often doesn't work. I know there are exceptions to that. And I think it's wonderful. I get really excited when people come in and tell me about their, their exercise regimen, their, uh, biking for thousands of miles and rowing for millions of meters. That stuff gets me excited. So got to get to it. Adding 10 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise daily may prevent 110,000 deaths in people over 40. Man, 10 minutes, people. Oh, <laughs> it's like not that hard. It's not that hard. Um, I like this quote, the secret of getting ahead is getting started because that's always the thing. It's like taking those first steps because the thing with this stuff, the thing with eating better and moving more and getting enough sleep is that you feel better. Everyone feels better. Right? And we all kind of feel like, oh, not so good, going through, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it's hard to get started. So I'm, I do a lot of like cheerleading in the office and trying to get people to do the things. Honestly, back to all those labs, right? All those labs, all that testing, all those vials of blood. It's like, guess what all this says? This says eat better, move more. <laughs> but somehow when we quantify it and we see it in colors, it makes a difference. Because we're human, we're thick-headed, you know, all of us, myself included. What kind of exercise is the best, they asked me. It's the kind you will do, right? It doesn't matter, really. I mean, yes, maybe there's a best, but really it's what you'll do because the key to success is consistency. Whether we're talking about eating differently or moving differently or anything, right? It's a habit. How do we make habits? It takes time, it takes effort. If I'm pressed, then in fact, the best kind of exercise is varying your heart rate, which makes sense because it replicates what we used to do, which is all the things, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No one just like, just got on a treadmill and just, you know, jogged for two hours. That wasn't a thing. Not that, you know, that's better than nothing for sure. So there's this scientific seven minute workout. And if you heard of this, I was in the New York Times and made all the papers, it's scientifically proven to be effective, seven minutes. What did you, what did you waste in your seven minutes today? I drove too much. That's what I did. Everyone has seven minutes. So the point is that, you know, 
you find the time, right? You can always find the time. There's an app for this, of course there is, right? Um, so just an idea. Oh, what should I eat? I mean, you know all this stuff, right? You know you should move more. Mediterranean diet, you know that, everyone knows that, but so what? Knowing it, <laughs> only gets it so far. So yes, in fact, just because I'm Italian doesn't mean I'm that biased. In fact, the Mediterranean diet is great um, by all the studies. And it's not the only game in town, right? I mean, there's not one great way to eat, but what's, what's the common thread between all the healthy diets? It's real food, it's whole food, it's less processed stuff. I mean, that's really what it is. It's less processed stuff, it's less sugar, it's less, less refined starches and carbohydrates. The soluble fiber is important. The omega-3s from fish is important. The healthy fats is important. And, you know, there's lots of ways to do that. Not just one. And you got to sleep. Got to sleep. Everyone has to sleep. No one sleeps enough anymore. I mean, kids, oh my gosh. Um, I mean, this is, you, this is, we should read through these. And this is important. Sleeping fewer than six hours a night or waking a lot raises the risk of developing damaging plaque in the arteries everywhere. Like just not getting enough sleep and you, you develop plaque, right? Because it's inflammatory. It's all about inflammation. Less than six hours, 27 more likely to have body-wide atherosclerosis, poor quality sleep, 34% more likely to have atherosclerosis. Like that's it. Like if nothing else, like get some sleep, you need it. It's how we repair damage. It's like the janitors come out at night and they clear out all the junk, right? They get rid of all the garbage in the cells. And if there's not enough time, then they leave some garbage behind. And then the next day, the next night, they leave some garbage behind. And then there's more and more garbage and that's inflammation and that does damage. And that's not just heart disease, right? That's, that's diabetes, that's dementia, that's all these inflammatory conditions. The basics are so important. If people just ate better, and move more and slept more and honestly didn't work as much, we would be so much healthier. It's all lifestyle, but you know, life, right? And I know, me too, I'm in it, I'm trying. I use omega-3s, I use fish oil and also non-fish-based omega-3s. It turns out that um, they, do a really nice job of reducing inflammation and they're good for HDLs and they bring down triglycerides. Um, some studies not too long ago about high doses of fish oil, even moderate doses of fish oil, contraindicated in arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation. So um, it's, it's worth using other methods if, if we have concerns like that. Um, I try to get people's magnesium up, sometimes by uh, diet, sometimes by supplementation. Uh, this is a picture of a vegan kale dark chocolate with pumpkin seeds, which is more or less all the magnesium sources in one place. I have not tried kale dark chocolate, but you know, don't hate it if you haven't tried it. Here's a list of magnesium rich foods. Um, magnesium is depleted by stress and many drugs and we don't get enough in our diets. So that's an important one. Some people we use niacin, um, this is a B vitamin. People are, don't go out and buy niacin or any of these things. Like that's not the point, right? The point is not the treatment. The point is the evaluation. Thank you. But niacin can bring triglycerides down. They can affect particle size. They can affect LPA a little bit. It can, there's different kinds of niacin. This inositol hexaconiacinate, which is, it says it's flush free. It also doesn't affect your cholesterol very well. So that's not recommended. So if we are doing niacin, we make sure we get the right one, but you're not gonna run out and get this. So it doesn't matter right now. Red yeast rice, you're not gonna run out and get right now. Um, but just to know, it has the same mechanism of action as the statin medications. So some benefits, some possible risk. Statins should be taken with, with co coenzyme Q10 and CoQ10, which um, is an enzyme that your body makes, but the mechanism of action for statins blocks the production of CoQ10 as well as LDL. And you need CoQ10 for the parts of the organs in your body that use a lot of energy, as seen here with muscle man. And those end up being the heart and the brain. And those are important. So 
CoQ10 if you're on a statin. I give it with red yeast rice also. Hawthorne is a really nice herb that I use for lots of cardiovascular issues, some of which are listed here. Cool little study not too long ago about glucosamine, but that was interesting. Um, I haven't tried to use this too much, but I'm starting to a bit. People use glucosamine chondroitin a lot because uh, I think of it as a joint supplement. Uh, the study showed that a good reduction in overall cardiovascular mortality in events when people had taken regular amounts of glucosamine chondroitin. I'm curious if you can get a similar thing out of just more sort of connective tissue and collagens. People are into collagen now. I think collagen is great. We used to eat that stuff when we ate more of the whole animal and we ate animals. Now we just eat the very little lean muscly bits and we get rid of the rest. So our, our dietary collagen levels are far, far less. So I like people just consuming more uh, real life collagen, but supplements are nice too. And look, if nothing else, another thing to consider is that you might want to get a dog because in both single person and multi-person households, dog ownership was associated with significant lower all-cause mortality and that says mortality and mortality. Well, that's not right. Uh, reduced cardiovascular risk with dog ownership. Why is that? Well, that's the stress piece, right? A little social companionship, a little emotional support, reduces isolation. Um, I, recommend, I recommend pets for people sometimes because we got to get the joy where we can get the joy, right? I will leave you with this. Your heart is the softest place on earth. Take care of it. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Heart Health Month. Um, again, here's us. There's some sort of specifics about a couple of addresses. We have more now. There's a Glastonbury office. You can tell on the website. Boom, boom, boom. Um, I didn't do the naturopathic medicine spiel, but if someone has a question, I can give it to them. We um, are in network with most major medical insurances, so there's really good coverage in Connecticut, but every plan is different, so you have to contact your company and uh, ask about naturopathic coverage. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Open it up to questions, right? Absolutely. If they'll put the questions in the chat, I'll read them off to you and you can answer the questions. Okay. One question is if you have CAD, is there a way to reverse it naturally? If you have coronary artery disease, can you reverse it? Uh, by all indications, yes. And that's gonna be different for different people. And of course there's progression and severity and yada, yada, yada. Um, coronary artery disease can look like soft plaque or hard plaque. Certainly soft plaque is modifiable. And that goes back to all those other things that we talked about and, and a lot of lifestyle stuff. Um, hard plaque, like calcified plaque, the, the party line was that it's there, then that's it. And you can just reduce getting more, but there's some small studies out of Japan using high doses of vitamin K2, specific form of vitamin K in reducing uh, calcified plaque. So we'll do that in some cases when indicated there are some other more sort of. Uh, I, I have know. a question. Significant treatment stuff. That we consider too, but uh, the answer is uh, yes and varied. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, how do we get rid of inflammation naturally? How do we get rid of inflammation naturally? That is the million dollar question. So when people come in and see me, whether it's for heart disease or headaches or stomach aches or arthritis, the key is if we bring the inflammation down, then you feel better. So that's what we gotta do. We gotta reduce the inflammation. And it turns out that the first thing we do is we look at what you eat, 
I mean, look at how you move. I mean, look at how you sleep because all those things affect inflammation. Uh, and then there are other things that we can consider. And, you know, we use vitamins and supplements and these sorts of things that are anti-inflammatory. But, you know, if we use diet as an example, if you're eating something that's causing inflammation in your body, then you can take all the turmeric in the world, but it's not really going to go too far because it's like trying to put out a fire over here while we're pouring gasoline on it over here. So I lean really heavily into basic lifestyle stuff. And sometimes it's a thing, you know, like don't eat so much sugar. And sometimes there's some food that might be healthy for one person and might be inflammatory for another person. So it varies from person to person, but there's always things we can do to reduce inflammation. And that always makes people feel better. Okay, another question is, does inflammation affect me, back joints, et cetera? Does inflammation affect? Knees, back, joints, and other. Does inflammation affect your joints? Is that what the question is? Musculoskeletal things? Yeah, yeah. knees, the back, the joints. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, so we're talking about somewhat, in some ways different, but also similar forms of inflammation. So it affects us in different ways. So um, inflammation in the blood vessels is going to be increase your risk of coronary artery disease. Inflammation getting into the joints is gonna feel like arthritis. So, you know, inflammation can land in all sorts of places and it's gonna feel like different things in different places, but the underlying inflammatory process is the same. So for example, someone comes in and they have arthritis or they have stomach aches or they have whatever, and we change their diet. We do like a, a month, super clean elimination diet. And they notice most of the time that after a month, their knees feel better and also their stomach feels better. And maybe they have less headaches and down the line, yada, 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 because it's all the same thing. It's just manifesting differently. Another question is quercetin. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly. The same as COQ10. Quercetin is not the same as CO or CoQ10. They're different things. Quercetin is an, uh, as a flavonoid antioxidant, and CoQ10 is a particular enzyme that's made from the body. They both have, no, I'll just say they're different. They're different. Okay. Thoughts on developing lateral circulation by routine exercise? Thoughts on developing collateral circulation by routine exercise. Yeah, I mean, that's part of what exercise does, right? When the blood starts pumping through, it's going to, in some ways, clear out the blood vessels. Not that simpl simplified, but, um, but among other things, it's gonna in improve the circulation elsewhere. So yes, we develop some collateral circulation. It's the best thing that you can do. I mean, eating well and, stay, and staying moving and getting enough sleep are all the most important things you can do. But for a lot, a lot of people, it's, it's, it's the toughest thing, but getting that blood pumping through your blood vessels, yes, absolutely does um, that and many other things to our benefit. Next question, is brain fog a symptom of inflammation? Brain fog can be a symptom of inflammation. Um, it could also be a symptom of something else. But most certainly when we, I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking clinically from putting people hundreds, I don't know, probably thousands at this point of people through, yeah, um, do elimination diets with the primary goal of reducing inflammation in the gut, which then reduces inflammation everywhere else. And yeah, I mean, brain fog reduces all the time. Next question, when is turmeric good? Recommended. So that's my favorite example because everyone goes out to take a turmeric supplement because they want to get their inflammation down. But you can't eat a standard American diet and take turmeric and expect it to do anything, right? I mean, maybe it'll do something, but it's not going to do much. It's like eating fast food every day, but thinking that like if you get a Diet Coke, then it's all going to be okay. So time and a place. And I, I certainly use anti-inflammatory supplements like turmeric, um, in, in certain cases, but I'm never gonna be like first line, just throw out a pill 
to do a thing because it's not going to do. I just had this um, conversation with a patient today, and how did I phrase it? I think I asked her if she wanted a thing for a thing because that's medicine now, right? Do you want a thing for a thing? Like, what's your what's your thing, and what thing can we give you for that thing? And I sort of reject the thing for a thing model. I'm kind of picking on turmeric. Um, and I use, I use things, I use supplements every day. I use them, but as, as supplementary, right? As supplementary rather, because the primary piece is, is different than that. If we rely on supplements as our primary intervention, then we're going to be on a lot of supplements. And I see people who are on buckets of supplements and that works for them, but I, I don't do that. And I couldn't do that. And I don't tell people to do that because I don't do that myself. So you know, sometimes, or it's complicated, or it depends. I don't know. It's a vague answer, but hopefully I answered it. If a stress test indicates CAD, what is the next step? Uh, it depends. It depends. I mean, I, I love working with cardiologists because they do stress tests, and they do echoes, and they do things to get information that I don't do and can't do. So the next step sort of depends on what the cardiologist thinks, right, at that point, because he or she is looking at a lot more abnormal stress tests, um, but I have my thoughts too. So, you know, we're always gonna lean back on the, on the basics and the treatments that we do. And then if more intervention is necessary based on the results of what, uh, whatever cardiovascular workup we're doing, then we're gonna consider those too, right? I mean, everyone's on the same page as far as goals. The goal is to keep your heart pumping blood through your body. That's what the cardiologist wants. That's what I want. And there's a lot of overlap in those Venn diagrams as far as how we get there. Um, so it becomes a, an in, a conversation right, between everybody. What vitamins, mineral, herbs are recommended? Say again? What vitamins, minerals, or herbs are recommended? Yeah, I mean, I, I would defer to my previous response. It depends because, you know, at the end of the day, right, I don't treat heart disease. I treat people that have heart disease and it's going to look different from person to person. Do I use a lot of the same things? Of course I do, but it's different from person to person. And it depends. It depends on what the labs show, right? We will, we'll test nutrients. We'll test your, your B12 and your folate and your iron, your vitamin D. And uh, do I need those things? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's get the number and assess. And then we can decide. So we're not just throwing darts with our eyes closed. Are there any other questions for Dr. Sulal? Okay, it looks like um, we're all set with questions. So we want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Dr. Fasulo, thank you for stepping in for Dr. Young and sharing this informative presentation with us. Um, it was a pleasure working with you. Oh. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. I mean, I'm, I, hope it, I, hope, I hope I conveyed the fact that I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. I really love it. I love working with people, getting this information. Um, because when we have the, this information and we can just, you know, inform decisions are good, <clears throat> are good and you know, helping people feel better. It says, I roll three to five times a week, around 25 minutes each time, and my heart rate max is 155 over 65. Should I be concerned? The person is 70, 67 years old. I don't, I don't, I don't think as a matter of that. No, I don't think that's, that sounds great, but you know, the reason that we spend an hour with people at the beginning and then see them is that we get all the information, right? So like, I'll never be able to answer the, how do I treat X or what do you think about this symptom? Because it's no one is just a symptom or a disease condition, right? It's always more than that. So um, those are always, we always just need more information. And then when we, so we get all the information, we can make good educated decisions to keep people healthy. Okay. Any other questions? Okay.
Okay, Carmen says, thank you both so much for the information. I filled out the new patient packet for your practice and looking forward to starting. Okay. Great. Have a, have a great night, everybody. Happy February Heart Health Month. Happy Valentine's Day. And, uh, you know, love your neighbor. Take care of each other. <laughs> Just have a good night, everybody. Take care.